Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. Let's pray. Father God, we're so grateful, Lord, that you have already visit us, that you're here in our midst, Lord. We couldn't ask for more, but your presence with us. But now I ask that you would bless your word, Lord, that your word goes forth and accomplishes what you send it out to do, Father. Lord, just as you're blessing us here at the Rock, I pray a blessing over all the churches in an inland empire and around the world, Lord. We don't consider ourselves better than them, but we are co-labored together with them, Lord God. So we say it publicly and we pray for them because we believe that we're advancing your kingdom, not our own, but yours, Father. So bless them today as you bless us. In Jesus' name we say, amen. amen. All right. Well, as a title, uh, you know, I was, I've been praying and doing certain things, and I just put it, a year of goodness, if you take notes, a, if you take notes, a year of goodness. And uh, many times it's, it's hard to think on the year in that perception, especially a year like we have had, you know, uh, in the last few years. But you know, end of the years are tough for me. I always tell my wife, I always kind of set her up, hey, it's coming the end of the year. I don't know why. I tend to be, um, I, I think about things, evaluate things. And so some things are good. Some things, oh, man, I didn't accomplish everything I wanted to. So end of the year, sometimes I'm in a down mood, kind of thinking through everything that has gone on. But a lot of times we have to remind ourselves that there's actually goodness from God in us. And there's actually goodness of God for us. And it's very, very important that we do that, that we connect with that desire of God for our lives and for what he wants to do. Just remind ourselves every time, man, there's goodness in my life. There's a story in the Word of God, actually an entire book if you want to look for it, because um, the, the name is kind of weird. The name is Habakkuk, Habakkuk, if you get it. I can even say it. There you go. <laughs> if you have one of those rock Bibles, it's in page 1339, but um, it's towards... End of the Old Testament, almost beginning of New Testament. Habakkuk is an interesting, interesting guy. And I want to look at how God manifests his goodness to us through his situation because it's very similar. Let me give you the background. Habakkuk is a prophet. They call it a minor prophet, not because he was uh, less important, just because what he wrote was small. But he's a, a tremendous man of God. But here's what's going on. Here's the back of the starting to pray to God and say, God, what is going on? Look at my people. Look what's going on. There's evil all around him. There's things going bad all around him. And he can't find anything good. Does that sound familiar? And so Habakkuk is... Complaining to God, saying, hey, let's square this out. Let's talk about this because I see things that are not going the way they should go. Chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. In verse 3, he goes in saying, there's iniquity all around me. There's evil things happening. People go to court, and the evil people win, and the bad people lose the judgment. Man, he wrote that last week, huh? <laughs> For many of us, he's exactly in the place that we find ourselves in. The important thing is that in his conversation, in his prayer to God, God answers him. Because anytime we pray... There's going to be an answer to come your way. Even if you felt this year, God, what I prayed beginning of January, I didn't see it happen. Things didn't come through. I, I, I don't know what's going on. We're going to learn from it. How Habakkuk reacted and understood what God was bringing to him. So if you can put it, if you can place yourself in his shoes, and if this connects with your situation, I am asking you to watch how the Lord deals with him. Because the way he deals with it is a way that's going to help us deal with our own situation. Because there's a year of goodness upon us. We just saw the goodness of God display before your eyes. And it's important for us to see that God is doing something. God answers, or for me, in my study, I see three things how the Lord answered to Habakkuk. And then the way Habakkuk res responded back to God. How to experience his goodness. To experience his goodness, very first thing right away is you have to see his goodness. You have to see his goodness. Listen, there's goodness all around us. There's goodness all around us. And it's very hard for us not to see it. But sometimes we're so inward in our own situation that it's very hard to look anywhere else and find the goodness of God. 
And so because our own situation is so tough, it's so difficult, it's like Habakkuk saying, everywhere I look, God, there's a problem. Everywhere I look, here's God's answer. Verse 5, chapter 1, the Lord tells him, look among the nations and watch. So the Lord tells him, here's my answer to your prayer, that you don't see anything good. Pay attention. You hear that? That's what the Lord tells him. Look, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, meaning you will be so impressed. Continue saying, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told to you. Imagine that. The Lord answers and says, listen, you think everything's bad? I want you to look around because what I'm doing is so amazing that even if I tell you, you won't believe it. You won't believe it. And many times we have to see the goodness of God around us. We have to open our eyes and look at the goodness of God around us. One thing we did this December in our Spanish services, we spent the entire month sort of talking about uh, testimonies and things God is doing in other people and just sharing the testimonies in our services. Why? Because when you hear the goodness of God in someone else, it inspires you to get out of your own situation. When you see it, all of a sudden you say, man, it's good for them. It's going to be good for me. It's going to inspire me to do something good. So God's solution to finding goodness is you have to look around. God is telling them, open your eyes, Habakkuk. Look around. You would hear things happening in other nations that are absolutely unbelievable. Isn't that the truth? Isn't the truth that God is doing something amazing in a brother, in a friend? You come to church and hear, Pastor, you wouldn't believe. I just came to church last Sunday, and right before the service, a lady walks up to me and said, Pastor, I need to tell you, I need to tell you, my daughter called me from Mexico, and um, her son had, was diagnosed with a tumor in his brain, and they brought him here to La Melinda. They went back to Mexico City. They came back here to the States, and nobody would find a solution. So we started a prayer chain here at church, in the Spanish service, in her small group, everywhere. People were praying, and she came to me and said, my daughter called me last night, that was so Saturday night, and said they came back from the doctor that morning. They did a the fourth or fifth MRI, and the doctors are marble, gone. Tumor is absolutely gone. And so she was in tears, just absolutely telling me, Pastor, you have no idea. This has changed our lives. He's been going through this for years. And so when you see the goodness, you understand, I may be sick, but God is up to something. Things are not going the right way for me, but I know if I open my eyes, he's doing things that if you tell me, I'm going to say, man, that sounds hard to believe, but he's at work. Because we have to see his goodness. Amen. We have to see his goodness. God is so good. Reminds me of a story of a lady in, uh, in the post office. There's a postal worker, you know, during Christmas, the week before Christmas. And the postal worker is working and he's sorting out the letters. And see a letter, kind of handwritten, you know, kind of crumpled up letter with no stamp on it. So he pulls it out of the stack, looks at it opens it and reads it. It's a letter to God. It said, Dear God, somebody broke into my house a week before Christmas and stole my $200. And so, man, this um, postal worker is absolutely heartbroken. So he talks to his friends. Hey, listen, look at this letter. This is unbelievable. Let's do something. They start, you know, collecting as best as they can. They put together $180. So he puts it in an envelope, drops it in the lady's mailbox, and just, you know, anonymously, she just puts it there. So, a week, the day before Christmas, finds a letter, kind of similar, crumpled up, bad handwriting, kind of the same handwriting. So he says, oh, man, what's going on? He opens it, and it's a letter to God. Same lady. Dear God, thank you so much because you provided. Give me $180. Christmas is going to be better. P.S. There was, it was $20 short, but I know it was those postal workers that stole it, so don't worry. <laughs> You knew where I was going, huh? <laughs> we have to find goodness in everything we see because there's good stuff happening. Point number two is you have to rehearse the goodness of God. You have to rehearse the goodness of God. You have to remind it to yourself. You have to say it to yourself. Every morning when I wake up, quietly, because if I wake up my wife, she'll hit me with a bat she has next to her bed. Just kidding. Um, but I say to me, God, it's going to be a good day. This is going to be a good day. Even if I feel absolutely miserable, I say, there's going to be goodness coming my way. Something good's going to happen. You have to say it to yourself. You have to rehearse the goodness of God. Believe that there's goodness. Something good happening to you. This is God's answer to Habakkuk, and I love it. He tells him in chapter 2, 
If you go there with me, if you have your Bibles there, mark it because we're going to look a few verses, but you want to mark your, yours because we're going to come back to it. If you have one of those red markers. Chapter 2, he says, Habakkuk starts going and says, I will stand my watch and set myself on a rampart, on a rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer then when I am corrected. So he comes along and says, I'm going to watch out what God's going to tell me. That guy's crazy. I mean, I want to stand right here and he's going to talk to me. So, but I love God's answer, always with mercy and always opening our eyes. And he says, verse 2, then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come, it will not Terry. So it it sounds kind of contradictory, but God is saying, I want you to do something. I want you that. When I tell you something that's going to happen in your life, I want you to write it down. And I want you to make it so simple that anybody can understand what's going on. And not even better yet, it's going to be for an appointed time in your life. There's going to come a season. I love when we were talking about Christmas, where it says in Galatians and other parts, at the appointed time, God sent his son. There was a specific time For what's going on in your life. It may not be now. It wasn't this year. But there's an appointed time. And even though it seems long. It won't be long. Because it's in God's timing. And to see God's goodness. You have to rehearse it. You have to repeat it to yourself. Write it down. Let yourself know. Man God I know this is coming. I know you're going to bless me in this particular way. It's very important for you to do that. We have in our family my wife, she was given, uh, when we got married, a journal. And in this journal, she writes all the testimonies. It started that way when we first got married. She would write down things that God was doing. It's so funny because sometimes we read it when we have to remind ourselves and see what God, what God has been good and done to us. Then we have to rehearse it. And sometimes we read some of our prayers, Lord, we're $20 short. You know, 10 years ago for us, that was a, a ton of money. We were like, oh, my gosh, we're $20 short on something. You know, but now we see God's goodness that we know he's done. Because then you see the answer the Lord provided. So-and-so gave us money. And, and it happened that way. I remember when our first child was born. We had no medical insurance, um, and so I had barely started this job, so I had no access to benefits. And so, you know, you may be in this position. I remember we pray, we believe God, and by tremendous provision, by people blessing us, we were able to pay for everything. And so I believe that God is that good, that God is going to be good to you, that you may say, Pastor, I have no medical insurance and and I'm struggling. Pastor, I'm in a tough situation right now in my life. You have to believe for God's goodness and you have to rehearse it upon your life. You have to say it and believe it in your life. You have to write it down, make it plain because it's coming your way. There's an appointed time for that. And until we do that to our lives, until we remind ourselves of the goodness of God upon our lives, we cannot see it. Sometimes we're so closed up here with everything else. And so we have to put in here and in here more than anything, God goodness in our lives. I am a news junkie. And I understand when Pastor Deborah says it too because she loves watching news. But I am a news junkie. I listen to the radio. But sometimes you just can't go there. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect you right in the heart. It's going to affect you right in the situation you're in. The jobs are bad. Things are difficult. All this year is terrible. Double dip recession. Who knows how many recessions. I dip once and hasn't come up for air. Whatever it may be, you know. It doesn't matter. What's going on is you have to focus upon the goodness of God. When you focus on the goodness of God, none of that seemed to become a very big deal. Here's what David does. And David has an amazing uh, uh, thing that he always shares. There's, I'm telling you, I had to cut out verses because there's so many Psalms that express the goodness of God. Here's Psalm 3119. Um, New Living Translation says, Psalm 3119, how great is the goodness you have stored, you have stored up for those who fear you. And then it says, you lavished it on those who come to you for what? Protection. For protection. And then I love this part. Blessing them before the watching world. See, the goodness of God, number one, is for people to see. For them to see it and for you to rehearse it. When you're blessed, when the goodness of God comes upon you, he's doing it 
upon the watching world. Everybody's going to see and say, oh, my goodness, they're blessed. They're blessed. Something's happening in their life. Something miraculous has happened in their life. And they start believing in the goodness of God upon their hearts and upon their lives. And for us, it's very important to believe that, to know that, to write it upon our own hearts, to say, Lord, I'm going to believe your goodness because that is exactly what the Lord told him. Here's another psalm I want you to read with me. Psalm 34a says, O taste, you already know this one. O taste and see that the Lord is what? The Lord is what? Good. Blessed is the man or the woman who trusts in him. Taste and see. The psalmist is saying, and there's several verses like that. He said, when God goodness comes upon you, you can taste it. It'll be something delicious to you. You would know how good it is because it'll, be, it'll bring such a goodness into your own life. You say, God, I can taste your goodness. I can feel it in my own heart. I can see that you're doing something amazing in my life. Listen, unless you see it and look around you, unless you rehearse it in your own life, you're not going to feel the goodness of God in your life. And that's very important for a year like we've had. You can't say, man, I'm hoping 2012 is going to be good. I'm telling you it's going to be good, but you're going to have to do something about it. You're going to have to see the goodness of God, and you're going to have to rehearse the goodness of God in your life and say, before this year end, I'm going to, be see, I'm going to see God's goodness upon my life, and I'm going to believe it. It will come to pass in my own family. To experience his goodness, number three, experience his goodness. Believe in his goodness. Believe in his goodness. Believe in his goodness. See, many of us have to connect with the fact that we have to believe what God says. Unless we believe what he's saying, then what are we doing? We have to believe God's word. We have to believe that his goodness can become something true and real in my own life. Are you with me? Here's the answer right there. Um, chapter 2, verse 4, then the Lord's still answering. I love this answer. It's something you know, but God told Habakkuk a long time ago, and it's repeated in the New Testament many times. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him. Here's the Lord saying. Now, here's the phrase. But the just shall live by what? You say it with me. Can you repeat that? But the just shall live by his faith. By his faith. By his faith. Not on your mama's faith. Not on your auntie faith. On his, on your own, on what you're able to say, God, I'm going to believe it. That's why even though my wife is praying for my home, I know she is, I have to say to myself, I'm going to believe your goodness. Something good is going to happen in me today. I believe it. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I believe it. It'll be, I will dwell in your house forever. I, I say those things upon my life because I have to change my mindset and believe something good is coming our way. Something good is coming in my life. Amen. You have to believe in the goodness of God, even in the small things, even in the small, th in small things in your life. Here's something God showed me when I was reading. The victory of faith is in believing. I'll repeat it. The victory of faith is in believing. So I asked the Lord, what does that mean? The victory of faith is in the fact that you chose to believe even before you saw the answer to what you were believing for. Then faith becomes triumphant. There's a victory in you when you already believe what you know is going to happen in your heart. So you have to believe for the goodness of God to be manifested in your own life. And those things happening. This morning, I'm driving into church. And uh, it was one of those mornings. So we pulled into the Starbucks drive through And, um, you know, I make my order. And you kind of know already where I'm going. I get to the window to pay. And the lady tells me, oh, the guy in front of you already paid for your order. And he said, Merry Christmas to you. I said, well, Merry Christmas to him too. But, <laughs> but I was so happy because here I am believing for God's goodness. And in something really small and simple, God shows it to me. That guy didn't know who I was. He just said, I want to pay for their order, whatever it may be. And the lady said, I asked him, what if it's a lot of money? He said, I don't care. You know, it happened to me too. And so when goodness comes your way, then it's time for you to see. It is time for you to rehearse it. It's time for you to believe it, that God is doing something amazing in your life. Amen? You have to put it in your own heart, the goodness of God. Here's a psalm that I love, Psalm 27, 13. It says this. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
I'm going to read that again. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Here, here, here's David. Here's this man, amazing man that believed God for tremendous things, believed God for great things, had tremendous insight. Yet David is saying, man, I'm about to lose heart because everything I see around me is a mess. It's a mess. And he said, but because I know that I'm going to see the goodness of God in this day and age before I die, then I'll be okay. Then I'll be okay. And for you and I, that is really important that you connect with that area of your life that you're saying to yourself, I know in this day and age, I'm going to see God goodness in my own life and in my own situation and in my own, uh, uh, my own life, kids, family, job, etc. Unless you do that. You're going to always just be looking inside of you and saying, I don't measure up. Things don't add up. Oh, this year didn't go as good as I thought it would be. Or maybe your year went phenomenal and you're saying, Pastor, this is good. And, you know, I saw God's goodness. Then maybe you should display it for others to see. See, it goes both ways. If you display it for others to see, you will help other people believe the goodness of God. Because the just shall live by faith. God is so good. God is so good. See, many of us, this is a, a faith-believing church. Every, you know, every time I've been here, Pastor Jim and Deborah always teach us on faith. I've learned so much on faith since I arrived here, and it's so important because the Lord, not Habakkuk, the Lord told him, this is the solution for your problem. Here's why this revelation is important. In chapter 1, when the Lord tells Habakkuk, hey, open your eyes and see the nation. I'm going to do something great. The very next verse, you can read it at home, verse 6, I believe it says, I'm bringing the Chaldeans and they're going to punish the people. Then Habakkuk goes crazy and said, Lord, you're going to bring an evil people? You're going to bring a town that's 10 times worse than your own people to punish us? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? The Lord later answers in chapter 3, but... Um, and, and end of chapter 2, but it's so important for you to see that because many times we're seeing, oh, the answer of the Lord is going to be phenomenal. I'm going to get a race. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But it may be that things get tighter in your life so that things that are not supposed to be there be exposed. Guess what? God used the Chaldeans to bring correction to Judah, but then God crushed the Chaldeans and raised Judah. And raised Judah. Why am I saying this to you? Because the goodness of God goes through a process in our life. Unless you see it, unless you rehearse it upon your life, unless you believe it, even though when you look around, you're saying, man, I work for the Chaldeans. Pastor, what's going on here? <laughs> you got to believe the goodness of God is going to be upon you. He's going to protect you and cover you in that job. I don't know if I share this with you. If you're going to give a hand, give it to God or don't give it at all. But it's for him, not for me. I don't know if I shared this before. I know I've shared it at Spanish service, but I used to work when I was in, in my secular job before I started a full-time ministry. And uh, I worked in this job, and I was a supervisor of this dental company, and 90% were women. And so sometimes, as a man, that's really hard to do. Supervise all females, it's really hard. There's emotions, you know, and, and so uh, you kind of act like a commando because you're a guy, and so the ladies are all crying. And so I'm, I'm like, you know terrified every time I went to work I would come home and I'm like honey what am I doing wrong this woman cry and all this stuff and it's all emotional <laughs> so it was like crazy working there but I remember there was there was two ladies specifically that absolutely hated my guts I have no idea why I, I don't recall making them cry but no uh, but I remember I wasn't bad I was just trying you know really committed really trying to be honorable to the Lord not misspend because I was in charge of the budget all these things I mean I had a boss that I needed to produce a certain amount of money every week needed to report there was a lot of stress but these two ladies absolutely did not like me I mean there's nothing I could do give them extra days off it, it, it didn't matter you know there was nothing I could do and I remember she said you know what we're gonna pray for them we're gonna pray for things to turn around we're gonna pray for things to start happening in your situation just like the Lord told Habakkuk say listen you have to see it you have to write it but you have to believe it that even though things are hard the Chaldeans are in your way I'm doing something and I remember when we agreed in prayer, within a few months, those ladies were gone. And the whole atmosphere of the job changed. And I was there for another year and a half. And it was an unbelievable experience seeing the hand of God in the midst of that situation. I believe God was doing something good. 
I believe I, was tr- I wasn't trying to do something bad against anybody. I just wanted to be honorable to the Lord and honorable to my boss. And the Lord blessed me for it. But I had to believe. I had to believe that good things were coming my way, that God had his hand upon me. So I know the situation you're in. I know if you're in the secular job, I understand your position. I understand how you feel. And I'm telling you today that if you ask upon the Lord and say, every time you go to work, sir, God, there's going to be goodness. I'm going to sell today. I'm going to do something good. Something good's going to happen. Things are going to start coming your way. Listen, this is not positive thinking. I'm not asking you to sit, you know, cross your leg, mm, good things are going to happen to me. That's not what we're talking about here, okay? We're talking about rehearsing the goodness of God and what his word says. That's what we're talking about, believing that he's going to do something amazing. This is Habakkuk's answer to what the Lord did in him. So three things so far you've seen. You have to see his goodness. You have to rehearse it in your life. You have to believe it. This is his response, and I love it. End of chapter 3, if you go there, end of chapter 3, this is where faith is triumphant. This is where your faith says, I, I, I'm believing God. I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to stick with him. This is what he says, starting, I believe, verse 17. This is how he answers after hearing everything the Lord is telling him. Are you ready? It says this, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there's no herd in the stoles, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will joy in the God of my salvation. Listen, Habakkuk all of a sudden has a change of mind. He said, I'm not going to complain to God. I'm not going to tell God he doesn't know what he's doing in my life. I'm not going to tell God, God, how come you don't answer the question, or you don't answer my prayer that I want an answer, in the timing I want to answer. God, how's it come that everywhere I look, things are not going right. My wife and I are not in the right plane. My kids are not right. My job is not connecting the way I want it. There's not enough money where I'm at. How come you're not answering what you said you will? Habakkuk said, forget that. I'm going to look around, see that God is doing something good. I'm going to write it down, and I'm going to rehearse what I believe he's doing in my life. I'm going to have faith in what he can do upon my life. And because of that, no matter what happened, no matter what happened, I'm going to rejoice in God. Let's, let's describe this. This is what he says. He says, though the fig tree may not blossom. You know what that means? I mean, if fruit doesn't come in the right time when it's supposed to come, it's Okay. Though the fruit on the vines, meaning they're not going to have anything to produce. Though the labor of the olive may fail, meaning there would be no oil for cooking, no oil for doing things, no oil for selling in the market. There would be no money. Though, may, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, meaning there's no meat. There's nothing to do. There's no herd. Yet he answers. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the Lord. I need need to let it sink in your heart. You know why? I'm many times like you. I want to rejoice after I see it. I guess I'm the only one honest around here, but that's okay. You and I are sort of the same way. We want to say, Lord, man, when that check comes in the mail, ooh, party on. (laughs) When I get that report from the doctor, ooh, it's going to be good. When I get that promotion, it's going to be good. Habakkuk said, forget all that, even if it's bad. Goodness is coming my way. I'm going to find it, I'm going to rehearse it, I'm going to believe it, and I'm going to rejoice in it from the, till the day that I see it. And that is so important for all of us. To this year and in a few days, year to come, if I can ask you to believe a word in your life is that put it in your heart and say, I'm going to see it, I'm going to remember it, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to have faith in God that good things are coming my way. Because unless we do that and allow the goodness of God to absolutely shower us, absolutely come upon our life, it's going to be hard for us to get our minds out of our own situation. We have to connect with his goodness. Would you do something with me? I have a few minutes. And I wanted to do this so we can remember Psalm 23, 6. It's going to be up here on the overhead for you. Psalm 23, 6. But I want us all to read it. And I want you to let that sink in your heart today as we end. 
Psalm 23, 6. It's here for you if you don't have your Bible. Are you ready? If you can say it with me. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're going to say it one more time. And by the way, forever meaning till the day I die. That's what David was saying. Till the end of my days, I want to be with him. Would you say one, one more time with me? One, two, three. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Tonight. Amen. Give him a hand. He deserves it. Tonight. If you want to experience his goodness, if you want to connect with what God is doing in your life, in my life, in people's life, do four things as the year ends. See it. Look for it. Find somebody. Tell them what God is doing in their life. You tell them what God is doing in yours. Rehearse it. Just say it upon your life. Every morning, just say, God, you're good. God, you're going to do something good. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, Lord. As I go to work, as I drive, as I'm at my parents' house, I'm visiting my cousin, there's going to be goodness coming my way. Believe it. Know that no matter what happened, it's going to be good for you. And rejoice in it. Start partying, even if there's nothing to party for. You understand what I'm saying? You have to start believing that something's good is going to come your way. You have to start celebrating, saying, Lord, it's going to be good. I know it's going to be good. I know you're going to bless me. I know you're going to do something wonderful in my life. I can see it. I can feel it. God's going to be good. God is going to do tremendous thing. I know we've had to do it with our kids. We've had to do it in our own family, in everything we do, in ministry, even in La Roca, every morning, every single morning, before I get up to preach, I always tell them, you can ask anybody from La Roca, I always say, God is good. And we have to be reminded if there's something that for me this entire year has been, has been that word. I have to see God. I have to rehearse his goodness. I have to believe it. And I will rejoice in it. If God spoke to you, give him a hand. He deserves it. Thank you, Lord. Oh, amen. Hey, let me remind you of a couple of things before um, I have a chat with you. But one of the things we want you to do is... You come this weekend. Don't stay home. I know we stay up late, sometimes waiting for the new year. But come, enjoy. God is going to have a word for you. And then Sunday night, changing time, there's going to be prayer and praise. I love prayer and prayer service because it really sets up in a really good point in the year. If you have a petition in your heart, you got to bring it that day. There's going to be plenty of faith for everybody in this room. I believe it. I love those services. Pastor Jim and Deborah are going to be here leading us in prayer. And so it's going to be an amazing time. This weekend, um, also we have Shiv coming up on Friday. They're going to have their, their year in service Sabbath. So there's always something happening. If you have Spanish-speaking neighbors and friends with living in Southern California, I cannot imagine that you don't. So invite somebody, okay, because I love them all, and they're going to have a great time when they come to see us. We love them there, and we give them the word of God, and it's going to be amazing, amazing, because God is going to be in their hearts too. I want you to do something for me. We're almost done, but I want to make sure you're right with God. Everybody that I see here looks familiar to me. Maybe you came up front at first, but I still need to be obedient to God and do my part. Is that okay? I want you to give me five more minutes. I won't take more of your time. Actually, we have plenty of time. We're still ahead, but I want to do that because I want to make sure that your heart is right with God. Today you heard something that it was about the goodness of God. Actually, there's a verse in the Word of God that is His kindness of, good, of His goodness that brings you to repentance. What is God saying? God is saying, it's not His fifth, it's His hand saying, hey, listen, you're bad, and that's it. But it's actually His goodness that said, I know you're bad, but I still want you. I know you've been a rascal sometimes, but I still have a plan for you. How interesting that God says in his own word, listen, that is his way we get to meet with him. I want you to do something for me. We always ask this question because this question is very important, very crucial. If you were to walk out of this place and you die, your heart stops, that's it. Where would you be in that moment? In heaven or in hell? See, it's very important that you answer that question because I always say this, every eternal decision is made while you're on earth. I'll repeat it. Every eternal decision is made while you're on earth. You don't decide after you died where you go. 
You decide now, this moment, this hour. And this is your time. See, God wants you to be with him in heaven. Many people say, especially in America and Latin America too, where we grow up with a certain understanding of God and religion, we always say, Pastor, we're all going to heaven. Of course. I went to church with my grandma. She took me to church, and I've been there. I know I'm going to heaven. There's no one in the Bible that says that because grandma told you and took you to church that you're going to make it into heaven. Nowhere. You say, Pastor, I'm better than that. I not only went with grandma, I learned verses, I know about that, I took classes, I understand the Bible. There's no such thing here that says you understand the Bible, you went, you did, you helped, that leads you to heaven. It doesn't. See, Jesus and God didn't leave it up to us. Well, the committee there, Goodwill Committee in, in, on Earth, they're deciding if you do certain things, then you have access to heaven. They didn't. Actually, Jesus gives it the answer. You want to know? Here's his answer. He says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one, I'll repeat that, no one comes to the Father except by me. What's Jesus' answer to your question and to your answer is, unless you do it through him in his way and the way he's designed it, you can't make it to heaven. You can't make it to heaven. And I want you to walk out of this place with the certainty in your heart that you said, I'm the right way, because if you're the wrong way, I want to give you a chance to change it today. I want to give you a chance to change your direction for your own life. How do you do that? And how do we do that here? Listen up. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, this is how we do it here in this church. I'm going to pop my hand. When I do that, you raise your hand. By raising your hand, you're saying, Pastor, I want to do that prayer because I believe in my heart God wants me to do that today. Because it's by the Spirit of God that you ask Jesus to come into your heart. You're going to say, well, that's kind of embarrassing. I don't want to do what those people did, come up front. I'm telling you, if you raise your hand, nobody will be embarrassed for you here. On the contrary, we're going to clap for you and cheer you on. Because we want you to go the way of God. Why is it important that you raise your hand? Are you ready? Are you ready? The Lord says, if you acknowledge me before man... I'll acknowledge you before my Father. But if you deny me, if you say, I don't want none of that, I'm going to say the same about you in heaven. Those are some harsh, strong words. But God doesn't want you to play around the church. He also said, when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Those are some tough words. That's tough love. You know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, I want you to be in or I want you to be out, but don't play with me. Don't play with me. God already, Jesus went to a cross, died for you. He gave everything he had so that you can have everything he's offering for you. There's only one way to do it. By asking the Lord to come into your heart today and forgive you of your sins. How do you do that? When I count to three. When I count to three, you raise your hand, and we're going to pray together in a moment. Who should raise their hand? Are you ready? If you're not ready about your salvation, you have to be, and you have to know that today before you walk out those doors. That's the person who should raise their hand. Who should raise their hand? That person today sitting there saying, I know God spoke to me, and I know I have to change my way. This is your opportunity to do that. This is your opportunity to connect with God. Who should raise your hand? They know in your heart that you're not right with God and you have to change your ways. You have to do that. This is your opportunity. I don't know many of you did it earlier, but I know there's some of you that didn't because the Spirit already knows that you didn't. And God is giving you an opportunity saying, this is your moment. I'm done. Now it's your chance. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to pop my hands. You raise your hands and we'll pray together asking Jesus to come into your heart. One, two, and three. Is there anyone here? God bless you. One, two, three, four, five, six. God bless you. You can can lower your hands. I see your hands. Anyone else? There's six brave people saying, Pastor, I'm ready. There's one more hand, but I, I don't see it. Well, seven if I see you. Okay. Is there anyone else? Eight, God bless you. Anyone else tonight on this side? Anyone else? There's eight brave people saying, 
man, I, I need that pastor. I have got to ask Jesus to come into my heart. Is there anyone else tonight that needs to do that? I know there were many before, but the Spirit of God is here and is asking you to change your ways. This is your opportunity. I'm almost done. It's your chance to do this tonight. Is there anyone else that needs to raise their hand and ask Jesus to come into their heart? Here's your chance. Okay, this is what I want to do. Those who raise their hand, I want to pray with you. And I'm going to ask you to take a bold bold move. Here's what I want you to I want you to meet me up front here, and we're going to pray together in a moment. If you're kind of embarrassed, ask somebody next to you and say, man, walk with me. I'm a little embarrassed, but I want to do that. I want to do what the pastor says. I want you to come down. If you didn't raise your hand, you can still do it. You can still come here, and we're going to pray together and ask Jesus to come into your head. So let's stand. Let's welcome them. Grab your Bible, your sweater, whatever you have with you, and meet me right here, right now, and we're going to pray together. Thank you, Jesus. I give you my soul. Even if you didn't raise your hand, get yourself here. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Come on, that's good. Lord, have your Keep coming. Even if you didn't raise your hand, the goodness of God is on you today. God is good. Come on, they're still coming. Make your way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, is that verse again is the goodness of God that leads to repentance. It's to know that God has something good for you and not bad. It's to know that this decision you're going to make today is going to be the best thing that you can ever do for your life to walk the way God wants you to walk. Would you give me a few more minutes? God, still tell me there's a few of you out there still out there. I want to pray, but you need to get down here and you need to ask Jesus to come into your heart. God is asking you this today. The goodness of God is upon here. I, I normally don't do this, so I feel kind of weird too, you know, but this is God's business. And so if you're there, make your way. We're going to pray in a moment. But if you're up front, we're going to pray together. And then Pastor Dave is going to talk to you in a minute. But I want to pray with you. I, I love praying with you guys. You know why? Because I want to encourage you and all of us. I want you to hear all of our voices praying with you, letting you know that this is going to be good. This is a first step into something amazing. If you're still out there, the Lord wants you to come. The Lord wants you to come and pray with us. Are you ready? We're all going to repeat in a moment. Say with me, Father God, Father God. I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior, that you forgive me of my sins, the wrongdoings I've committed against you. I ask you today to help me walk in your way from this day and until eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God is so good. Hey, listen. Do something for me. I want you to meet with Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is going to do something amazing in a moment. He's going to walk you through a few things. He's going to give you something completely free. Not, nothing weird is going to happen. He's an amazing man of God. And he's going to explain to you the prayer that you did. Sometimes you do a prayer, look, whoa, what just happened? We pray with that guy, and I don't know what happened. He's going to let you know what happened in your heart. And what you can see, he's going to offer you something called an SPT. It wasn't an SPT. It's going to be a personal trainer. Somebody's going to help you if you let him. And I recommend that you do. He's going to let you explain to you five things to help you get strong in your walk with God. Otherwise, you know what's going to happen? You're going to go back to do the same thing you were doing before. We don't want you to do that. We want you to walk straight with God from this day forward, okay? So follow Pastor David. He's going to pray with you, give you that information, and you'll come right back. Thank you, Lord.